Welcome to Let's Get Creative with Sam, the podcast. I'm Sam Rawlings and I'm a children's creative counsellor. That means I help kids unlock their imaginations and explore the amazing world of creativity. But being creative can also be a great way to take care of our minds and feelings, which is super important. In this podcast, we'll be doing all sorts of fun things. We'll be sharing creative tips and tricks that can help us feel good, interviewing other awesome creative folks in the industry who use creativity for mental well-being, and maybe even doing some creative challenges together that can help us express ourselves. So buckle up, get ready to unleash your creativity and explore how it can help us feel our best and let's have some fun. Good evening, good evening. How are you all? It's Tuesday. Did you see the sun shining today? I love it. It just feels so amazing. Hi, welcome to Let's Talk About Creativity with Sam. And this is my second episode of season three. And I am so excited to introduce my next special guest. Wow, she is amazing. I mean, she was in London the other week running away running away and just like yes getting what she needed and just that yeah absolute feels wonderful so i'm going to bring her on so that we can meet her i'm going to introduce to you all lucy hall hello hi sam hi lucy how are you doing really good thank you very good 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 um so um <clears throat> would you like to introduce yourself to everybody yes uh, my name's lucy i um i'm a teacher and i was a school leader for well the various parts of the last 18 years but i've recently gone through a big personal transformation so about four years ago <clears throat> i gave up drinking alcohol so i'm just about to leave the teaching profession and go full-time as a sober coach and i've launched the carnelius community um, which is a women's peer support network to help women support, but also challenge each other to set and achieve the goals they need to have the life they always wanted to live. Wow. Now that was a bit of a tongue twister for me. Can you re-say that, um, say the title? Because that were like, I were like, mm, I'm lost now. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's Carnelias, so C-A-R-N-E-L-I-A-S. We're named after the Carnelian crystal wow that's so beautiful um and um i do believe that um <clears throat> you was in london two weeks ago a week ago last sunday i was running the marathon i was very lucky i got a place through my running club bingley harriers and um i chose to run for the sober butterfly collective and alcohol change uk who both do fantastic work to help people who have decided to give up alcohol or who want or maybe need to give up alcohol um to get themselves back on track so sober butterfly collective is um a national organization but started here in okay. west yorkshire and they help people find other uh sober people or people who are perhaps sober curious and they arrange meetups and alcohol free social events and alcohol change uk are the fantastic charity behind dry january and do loads ah. of work to reduce alcohol harm in the uk wow and that is so incredible that um you're part of something that changes people's lives completely doesn't it yeah well i gave up drinking um New Year's Day of 2020. So just before lockdown, a few months before, I didn't know it was coming, obviously. And I'm very oh, glad God. that I yeah. made that change before lockdown because I, I really do worry about what would have happened to me if I had had, you know, not had to get up and go to school every morning. I would have probably seen my drinking escalate from a few glasses every night more at the weekend to, you know, mm -hmm. really probably quite a dangerous level. So, um, yeah they the work they do really helps other people 
to question the drinking, rethink it, explore alternatives and think about why they're drinking as well. Because, you know, you don't drink too much if everything's fantastic in your life. It's normally about something else, which I've discovered through my sober coaching. Um, so, yeah, I ran the marathon dressed as a butterfly for Sober oh, Butterfly really? Collective, um, <laughs> which certainly, you know, brought a different um aspect to the marathon experience gave me something to think yeah. about other than my aching muscles um but yeah it was brilliant to raise just over two thousand pounds so i'm really really happy with that oh congratulations that's amazing absolutely amazing and for such a wonderful cause as well so <clears throat> if we go back a little bit to before you kind of realized that you was at a stage where you was really struggling with your alcohol what was going on then for you so I was, I just, so back in 2019, I landed my dream job as a school leader, assistant principal at a fantastic, outstanding secondary school um, in a really challenging, deprived area. But I was already working for the, the, the same trust who are absolutely fantastic. Um, and I got this step up, this promotion to a different school in the trust to be on the senior team. I'm absolutely delighted. Um, but I do have stresses and strains going on in my life. Back then, my kids were, what were they, about six and four. Um, my husband so, was recovering from a very severe mental health problem, okay. like, um, you know, severe anxiety, depression, panic disorder. Um, and, you know, I'd sort of got through that, was helping him back on the path to being well again, bringing up my kids, main breadwinner because my husband had had to give up teaching when he got ill and um you know landed this job and I was so happy and I started I did the first term but I realized that I was you know it was hard it was a learning curve you know going up to senior leadership being very you know much on the senior leadership team spending most of the day either teaching or line managing people just always in charge always on always the boss always responsible for what's going on in the room um and dealing with staff who understandably you know teaching is hard work so a lot of line managing people was trying mm. to ask them to do more while helping them with their well-being which even before covid was was quite difficult for a lot of teachers so i was finding it hard took a lot out of me and i realized after the first few weeks that i was coming home and putting the kids to bed and then having a glass of wine and then it was like some nights it was two and then three and then at the weekend it'd be a bottle and or i might go out um mm -hmm. and eventually there was a there was a conversation had with my husband where he he wasn't really drinking anything anymore because of his mental health he, he felt it didn't serve him at all to drink um and i said to him oh, can you just make just make sure i don't drink on a monday let's just have mon let's have a night off a week and he was like well i have every night off um and i, I was giving my problem to him really going you solve this you make sure i don't drink on a monday and he said well you know what you like you know if i, I try to say you you don't really need a glass of wine you, you're just gonna you're just gonna have a go at me and i was like no 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 um but yeah sure enough the next monday i went for the fridge after the kids were bed and he was like uh you were gonna not drink and i was like oh no 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 but today's different i've had a really stressful day the kids were a bit of a nightmare at school had this really difficult conversation with a colleague um no, 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 I deserve a glass of wine. It's my little treat. It's going to help me unwind. And we left it at that. He was like, I'm not going to challenge you again. You clearly didn't mean it. But he said, you know, do realise it is you're drinking every night and you've just basically admitted that even on a Monday, you know, you're not going to stop. And that's not normal. And I did, that did sink in. And yeah, I realised I was drinking every night and I was literally finding it impossible to even not have one on a Monday. Just psychologically, the urge was so strong. You deserve it. It's a treat. It's a stress relief. So a few more weeks passed and there was an incident where I had a really bad hangover when some friends had come all the way up from down south and I couldn't even have a pint with them in my favourite pub that I used to work in. Absolutely fantastic little micro pub near us. Couldn't even have a drink with them because I was still so hungover from a night out at the pub quiz the night before um and i hadn't had a hangover for a long time i thought that was a sign that all my drinking was under control and it wasn't really a problem because i never had a hangover and then i had a hangover and then a few weeks later it got to christmas and a family member who whose drinking i was concerned about expressed concern at my drinking 
and that really made me think I was like oh my god if they're worried about me this is really serious now so I um, said to my husband I'm going to do something about this and I did a bit of googling I'd had over the years googled you know do I have a problem with drinking? Is what I drink normal? Am I an alcoholic? And I always got questionnaires back from, you know, the NHS and charities and things that always said it was fine. It was always things like, you know, do you get the shakes if you stop drinking? You know, do you drink in the mornings? And I never did any of those things. It was all in the evenings, glass of wine, maybe a gin and tonic, maybe a few beers if I went out. It was just, it was every single day that I was struggling with it. Did you think you had a problem then, Lucy? So I realised that I wasn't happy with my relationship with alcohol, which for me, that is a problem. You know, if I felt guilty about it, I felt ashamed. Um, I felt that I would like things to be different. But I came to that realisation very much on my own. Nobody in my life would have said she's got a problem because they didn't see that it was every night. My husband had said, I don't think this is completely ideal and it's not really normal to drink every single night. But, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it would just be a glass of wine normally, maybe a couple. It wasn't anything out of hand. I wasn't not, fun- you know, I was functioning really well. Everything was fine. So it was really me and my husband that felt there was a problem. But when this family member who'd stayed with us over Christmas was like, you having another one? on the 27th of December, they were like, you know, Christmas is kind of over now. Like normally we sort of calm down a bit now, don't we? And I was like, wow, they're worried about me. That's unusual. Um, Then I really thought, okay, this is serious now. There is something problematic about the way I'm drinking. So I downloaded, um, I found a a blog called Tired of Thinking About Drinking. And that was amazing. That, just the name of it, hit home I was like that is exactly how I feel I am tired of thinking about it think when can I have another one how many can I have you know how many bottles of wine shall I take to this family roast dinner because if I take two it'll look weird but if I only take one I might run out of wine and that would ruin my day um uh, you know I just thought about it all the time a lot of it was thinking about how much I wished I was allowed to drink at different times when I when I wasn't so why don't I drink a bit earlier in the evening, oh, I can't really, I want to put the kids to bed first. You know, could I start drinking at lunchtime on a Saturday? Oh, no, because I might have to drive the kids to one of their activities later mm-hmm. on. I was constantly thinking about when I could have a drink. Could I nip to the pub on the way home from work on my own? Yeah. Like, that's not really normal. And I wasn't doing those things, but I wanted to. It was always in my headspace. So yeah. I found this blog, had a read, realised that I was what's known as... um a a grey area drinker there's a fantastic um sort of personality in the sober space jolene gray who called uh, uh, jolene park sorry who coined this phrase grey area drinker that really described what i was doing there was a problem but it wasn't clinical basically in that grey area um so Um, can you kind of describe that a little bit to the um to the audience please yeah, so it's if you feel uneasy about your relationship with alcohol, you you would say that you would like to cut down a bit. Maybe you've tried to cut down and found it really hard. Like I couldn't, I found the Monday really difficult. Um, it's a type of drinking where you see alcohol as a positive, a reward for a, a tough day, as a stress reliever, but actually it's probably starting to make you a bit anxious. Alcohol is a depressant and so when you absorb alcohol into your bloodstream your brain releases stimulants to try and counteract that depressant effect but unfortunately the stimulants are still there when the effect of the alcohol is worn off so your brain's trying to do this balancing act and normally you end up with the alcohol wearing off the stimulants are still there so you feel like fizzy you feel antsy and of course what can you do to make that go away you need some more of your depressant to balance it out again so you have another drink so a lot of gray area drinkers are trapped in this cycle of you know feeling quite anxious and thinking that alcohol is the solution and actually if they just don't have the first drink they won't trigger that cycle that causes the anxiety so it's about using alcohol to relieve stress and not really realizing it's actually causing some of the stressed feelings you're having um 
and so a grey area drinker is someone who, who's starting to realise they might need to change their relationship with alcohol, but they're not clinically dependent. They don't get delirium tremens. They don't get withdrawal symptoms. They're not necessarily, um, you know, they wouldn't touch, NH the NHS wouldn't touch them for any kind of support because they are a functioning member of society, probably with a job, you know, kids. Yeah. You know, there are so many thousands of people trapped in that grey area at the moment, unfortunately. And that sounds a real difficult place to be in because, like you're saying, it's not where you're classed as a clinical, as an alcoholic as such. It's more about that kind of, that, like you say, that grey area, so that in-between. So, you, you know, I guess there's some denial, but not as much as like where you're just almost, the co you know, the saying as burying your head in the sand mm. because you knew yourself, didn't you, that there was something not right you was not feeling right you knew that you wanted to stop you'd got that yeah. in your head that you wanted to stop but you also was still seeing it as a treat and a mm -hmm. also most a reward as well i think it sounds like there must have been a lot of confusion for you as well lucy yeah once i started to question whether my relationship with alcohol was normal i realized a lot of my friends drank a lot less than me at this okay. point, you know, they they had kids and had sort of eased off mm -hmm. since we were young professionals, you know, in our 20s, going out straight from work and drinking loads. It all eased off and I was trying to sort of maintain that. I'd come home, put the kids to bed and then start drinking. Any excuse to go out where alcohol would be served, you know, I would take it. Because um, my husband didn't really drink. I always had a driver. If it was a family event, I could drink as much as I liked. Um, and my tolerance was really high, so I didn't really embarrass. I never embarrassed myself. I never ended up in A&E or, you know, getting in trouble with the police or in any kind of argy-bargy or anything like that. Nothing like that happened. It was internal. I knew that I was drinking more than I should. Mm -hmm. And I knew that my husband was a little bit worried about it, but not enough to be, you know, there were no ultimatums or interventions or anything like that. But it just built up. There was the, you know, there was... The hangover incident when my friends came, there was, you know, a family member questioning my drinking. Another thing that happened that, that actually was really pivotal, although it happened quite, a, it was a few months before I actually stopped. My daughter was about seven and um, I was, I used to always put her to bed unless I was too late home from school, which did sometimes happen. But I used to always put her to bed if I was home and read her a story and I would always wait and have my first glass of wine after that but I would be rushing the story trying to pick a short one trying to hurry her along getting quite irritable I'm ashamed looking yeah. back of how I behaved towards her and one night I thought well I've parenting genius I'll pour a glass of wine and take it up and read to her with my glass of wine and then I'll be all relaxed and she'll get relaxed happy mummy and I won't be rushing what a great mummy I am fantastic thought I'd hit you know parenting nirvana so i've got my glass of red wine sat on the armchair in her room and she just went mommy why have you got a glass of wine why are you drinking in my why are you drinking wine in my bedroom and i just thought oh that doesn't feel like something i should have my seven-year-old child saying to why are you drinking wine in my bedroom and i felt really icky about it and you know i said Ha, ha, ha it's just mummy's just having a nice glass of wine it's fine it's nothing to worry about and I did drink it and I read her the story and I made sure I gave her some extra time but after that I never did that again and I think that was something that I kept coming back to in my head that actually that's another that's another line crossed first there was I had a Monday night off and now I don't then it was I never drink till my kids are in bed and now I do and I just thought this is a slippery slope and I've caught it early yeah. And it's much yeah. easier to catch it early. If I leave this and break this barrier and start drinking in my daughter's bedroom every night, what next? Do I just come straight home and open the bottle of wine before, mm. you know, before 6 p.m.? Where's that leading? So, yeah, th there was just so many little things that ate away at my confidence that everything was fine. I just like to drink more than most people. Um, that in, in the end, I really... It was taking up so much of my headspace. I was really tired of thinking about drinking. Yeah, it must have been. Do you feel that it kind of impacted your mental health as well, Lucy? Yeah, I think so. Because it, 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 
there's a real shame and a stigma about having a problem with alcohol, you know, and I was a bit worried that I didn't really want to tell anyone that I was worried about it because I thought everyone would, A, sort of not really understand because they weren't living in my house and they would sort of go, oh, you're fine, it's fine, you know, laugh it off and minimise it. And I thought if if I get that reaction from too many people, I'm, I'll never stop. Um, but also that it was just embarrassing. You know, I didn't want to admit that I'd let something get out of hand. I didn't want people to think of me as unsafe around my children. You know, my job involved safeguarding responsibilities. I really didn't want anyone to be thinking that, I, you know, that I was drunk at work, which I never was. Um, so, yeah, it, it was the stigma that stopped me speaking about it. I did a couple of times do that thing. I don't know if anyone else has done this, but, you know, when there's something that's really bothering you, and you think you want to talk to a doctor about it, but you know how difficult yeah. it is to get an appointment. So I saved up a couple of problems, made a medical appointment, and then really quickly just talked about, you know, whatever the other thing was. And then Everything I went, else. can I, yeah, can I just ask, I'm I'm a bit worried about my relationship with alcohol. And the yeah. doctor said, well, how much are you drinking? I said, well, I drink a cup, you know, a glass of wine on a Monday and a Tuesday and then a couple more on a Wednesday and then quite a lot on a Thursday and a bottle Friday, bottle Saturday, maybe some beers and gin and tonics as well. And then a bit on a Sunday, probably with my dinner. And she just went, don't we all? Oh, goodness. And this is pre-lockdown. Um, so that, that just, I was like, doctor says it's fine. Doctor well, says yeah, it's absolutely yeah. fine. So literally doctor's person, given me... Yeah, absolute permission to continue. That that made yeah. me feel better for a few a few good few weeks. I, I mean, I know people who drank for years after having that kind of conversation with their doctor. Yeah. You know, they said, I, I realised it was the top of this slippery slope. I went to the doctor. They went, oh, my God, there's no intervention. You don't need anything. We're not going to give... What they mean is you're not clinically dependent on alcohol and therefore NHS services will not support you because they don't have the resources. It doesn't mean there's no problem. It doesn't mean you're not damaging your health. It just means you're not so extreme that the NHS is starting to worry about you, you know, and wants to intervene. So that that I can't actually remember. I feel like that conversation with the doctor was actually quite a long time before I stopped. I can't even remember when it was. Um, but I kept I kept myself reassured for ages. Every time I had a little worry, it was like, oh, but the doctor said it was fine. Hmm. Yeah, and and what I'm hearing from you is that so many people have had these conversations with doctors about their concern over their level of alcohol they're drinking and then almost being told that it's okay, it's fine to do that. Now, we know, don't we, that fine is a word when it's kind of like, if there's an anxiety and you're asked, how are you, and say, I'm fine, then that's connected to like you don't want to talk about it but mm -hmm. when you hear from a doctor that says it's fine it, it sounds really wrong and you know and and for those people and yourself to be able to accept that because that's what it's about isn't it it's that acceptance and that permission that oh this is okay i can continue this i'm not doing any damage i'm not hurting myself i'm mm -hmm. not hurting anybody else so and they said it's okay. They've said it's fine. So mm. actually, it's okay to continue. That must have been really difficult for you when you realised that what that doctor had said was <laughs> just so wrong. Yeah, well, I mean, lots of people have said, you know, I've talked about this a few times but it, on my sober coach training and with other coaches mm -hmm. I know, and they, loads of them have the same experience. And they've said it's partly because doctors are in the same position I was. They are yeah. very, very stressed frontline key workers battling yeah. against limited resources, seeing great need, powerless to do as much about it as the people asking them for help think they can do. And, it, you know, it's something that doctors themselves turn to for stress relief. And what, you know, if you're a, an embattled GP or other medical professional um, who does drink two, three, four glasses of wine most nights, you, you can't, you know, you're very unlikely to have the attitude of going, have you ever thought about just completely giving up? Mm, you know, well, so... Well. Yeah. What most people say they've, they've experienced is either doctors going, oh, you're fine. That's, oh, I've seen far worse. Or, oh, God, I drink about that, like what I got. Or they'll get, well, try to have one night off a week. Or just try to cut down a bit, alternate alcoholic and non-alcoholic drinks, which 
all of which I tried. I tried every moderation rule going, only drink wine, you know, never drink spirits, only drink when somebody else is drinking, don't drink at home. You know, don't go to the pub and then come back and drink. I'd, I'd had all of those. We'll have a night off a week. I tried all of it. Yeah. I couldn't keep it in its box. I just, every time I tried to put one of those rules in place, when the moment came to make the choice of I'm having a glass of wine or not, the wine witch would come whispering, say, you deserve it. You'll feel better. You need yeah. to relax. You've got, you've got a lot going on. This is your little treat, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, if there's one thing I would would love to campaign on when I've got, you know, the the expertise and if I could find the right allies, I'd love to do some education work with frontline health workers like GPs about how they can talk to people who have that, who initiate that conversation um, in a way that encourages them. So signposting them towards fantastic online organisations like um, there's the Sober Club um, you know, the Soberistas, there's so many fantastic, really low cost organizers like Soberistas, I think is like 19 quid a quarter to join. And it's an online community for men and women. And you get that support that you need and that community who've been there. There's people like me on there who've been sober for over four years, you know, giving advice and support. And That's there's amazing. people who are just starting and you can get, you know, friendly open non-judgmental advice and you can be anonymous you can hide behind a username you'd have to put a photo or anything um yeah. they could talk about that they could tell people that sober coaching exists that you can get a one-to-one -one expert who will take you by the hand and, and you know help you identify what triggers you drinking what's dictating the need to drink is it your stressful job is it family relationships is it you know, a, an underlying mental health condition. And, and sober coaches do a lot of work to educate people about brain chemistry and that that I talked about earlier, that alcohol is a depressant and causes your brain to release stimulants. And a lot of people who think they've got quite bad anxiety find that it's far, far better when they completely cut alcohol out. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd love to do some work helping frontline health workers, health visitors, you know, social workers, doctors, nurses, um, understand how they can talk to people about alcohol and just make cutting out completely sound like a reasonable thing to do. You know, don't wait for rock yeah. bottom. There's no need to wait until some sort of horrific life event forces you to stop the other thing that one of my clients said to me she said i thought it was alcoholics anonymous or carry on drinking i didn't know there were websites that didn't know about coaching until someone she knew who knew me she went to them and went that's it i've had enough i'm gonna have to go to aa i'm so embarrassed i can't bear the thought of going but i can't bear the thought of carrying on and this friend just went oh i need to introduce you to lucy she's a sober coach and they were like yeah. <laughs> and now she's she's doing amazingly so you know i think there's so many things out there that, that health workers and social workers could talk to people about to make it sound yeah. reasonable and not this massive deal um to actually just consider giving it up completely finding the support um and I guess GPs are a bit reluctant to um, send people to something that costs money. So even better if the NHS funded memberships of things like that or funded sober coaching or membership on a group. Um, but hopefully one day with social prescribing, we will get there. Absolutely. And you've already got that determination to go that way anyway. So I can see it happening let's say watch this space i can just see that happening at some point definitely and it sounds very exciting and you know it'll be just be able to support so many more people um so that is so wonderful and what a story you know what you've been through as well and and where you are now so that kind of leads us on to like what you changed you know how you changed your life so yeah so the first thing that happened was i downloaded this amazing book i think on the, i think it was the 28th of december after the conversation with my family member mm -hmm. i downloaded this book alcohol explained 
and it's a brilliant book by a guy called William Porter, who he's not a doctor himself, but he goes into the, the science of the brain and how alcohol acts on it. He's a, an ex-military man who's in the forces um, and developed quite a severe alcohol problem um, and decided to research what he could do to help himself. And he got completely sober a number of years ago now. And he wrote this book, Alcohol Explained, to share both the kind of, you know, the life experience of how he ended up giving up alcohol, but also this this brain chemistry stuff. And for me, the combination of the two was incredibly powerful. And I hadn't understood that alcohol, that your brain releases stimulants to balance out the depressant effect mm-hmm. of alcohol. And that's why you often want another one, like 20, 30 minutes after having a drink. That's why you get into this loop. And not everybody experiences that. Lots of people don't need to give up drinking because they're fine. You know, the brain just doesn't respond on such a level or their life circumstances, or maybe it's genetic. We don't really know, but some people are absolutely take it or leave it. But for those of us who aren't, for those of us who get this quite heightened anxiety or feeling of like antsiness once we've had a drink and we start wanting another one, it totally explained why I needed to completely give up and not just moderate. I tried, like I've said, moderation. I'd, I'd tried yeah. so many different ways of doing it and just nothing had worked. Whereas he said, if you just don't take the first drink, you're not setting off that doom loop of your brain trying to do this balancing act. So I thought, well, there, was, there, there must be something in that. I'm really unhappy mm-hmm. with the way things are now. Um, I want some change. It's New Year. So I said to my husband, right, I need to read this whole book. Like, I need to get this into my head. So can you you know, we were away staying with family for Christmas. Can you guys look after the kids for a couple of days? And I more or less locked myself away, read this book, went online, did some research and just completely became convinced that I needed to stop completely. I signed up for Soberistas, this website, and um, found just a vibrant, positive online community there of lots and lots of people trying to do a 100-day alcohol-free challenge. So I thought, okay, right, so it's three months, so I can get myself to springtime, yeah. um, feeling much better. And they very much say, like, you don't need to declare that you're never going to drink again, just take one day at a time. Um, you know, I'm not drinking today. And if you keep doing that one day, you won't have drunk for years. So I took that approach, but very, very quickly felt so much better. Wow. Um that I just wanted to carry on. So I'd never thought I had hangovers. I thought alcohol doesn't affect me. I just, you know, I wake up and I'm fine. I was getting up at 20 past five in the morning every day to to go to work and stuff. Um, But actually I realized I felt pretty rubbish. Once I had a week or so behind me of like, all the alcohol had left my system. It leaves, it's completely gone out of your system after about five days Um, and after about a week, I was like, wow, I feel so much better (laughs) in the mornings. I was sleeping better. I wasn't waking up. I used to wake up at about three or four in the morning, really like, oh, why did I drink? God, can't even have one day off. Particularly Tuesday morning was the worst. It was like, oh my God, why have I done that? I only had one glass of wine most Mondays, maybe two, but I would always wake up feeling guilty and embarrassed and ashamed. And then if I'd drunk a lot on a weekend, it was waking up trying to piece together how did I get home you know and there was never a horror story it wasn't I came home by a and e or I was rolled out of a taxi or anything like that but I would have blackouts where I couldn't remember big chunks of the evening and because I used to drink with a, a regular group of just fantastic people in the local pub but they didn't probably have half a bottle of wine before they went out and a couple when they came back they just went to the pub so we'd all be texting having a little giggle about what happened the night before and that's how I'd work out you know who I'd left with had I got a taxi or had I walked home or you know and I just thought this isn't this isn't great like you know so I'd wake up really anxious about can I remember everything did I do anything I shouldn't have done and and I you know I, I hadn't but I always thought yeah. the possibility was there because I couldn't remember and bits would come back through the day. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I was delighted not to be doing that anymore. So my sleep was loads better. Yay. Yeah, and sleep's so hard to come by <laughs> these days in the society <laughs> we're in. 
Um, so yeah, I sleep Absolutely. like a baby now, like really, really well. Uh, and well, you know, I, I notice it if something's going on in my life, I will wake up and not be able to get back to sleep, and it's like the bad old days. So, um, very pleased to see the back of that. I looked better, you know, my skin was clearer, the whites of my eyes were much, much brighter. Um, yeah. I was hoping that I'd magically lose about two stones. <laughs> <laughs> um that didn't happen straight away i would say to anyone who thinks oh if i you know i want to give up uh drinking to lose weight unfortunately what happens is you end up with a massive sugar addiction um you know your body still wants the sugar that it was taking in from the from wine or beer or whatever so i, I yeah. lockdown came in my 100 days came just into end of march um start of april 2023 so we we're in lockdown so i'd go for massive hikes with a huge bag of sweets in my pocket <laughs> from wine to wine gums um so it, i didn't lose any weight but i got into endurance sports so i did loads of hiking and a bit of i'd always done a bit of jogging i'd done couch to 5k you know after each pregnancy and after some injuries and stuff and i'd, I'd done one half marathon back in 2005 um but I found that really hard. Like the training was really hard. Um, and I, so I, I carried on running and suddenly was like, well, this is much easier now. <laughs> this is so much easier. Um, and I was getting up early. I had so much more time as well. Like, cause I, I would go to bed quite early, sleep really well and get up really early. So I could get up, get a run in, then see my kids, you know, and then when school opened again, which, schools opened quite early in lockdown because we had the, the key workers children and the vulnerable children in so I was back in school every day and it just made everything about life just felt easier and then I got injured running I couldn't run and I thought well I need this now I really need this is my new treat this lots and lots okay. of movement and activity and fresh air so I started okay. cycling with the fantastic Bingley Bells um who really built my confidence and then I started going out with Queensbury Queens who um do um a sort of slightly wider or back then they did a wider range Bingley Bells do loads of different rides now um yeah. so I got into cycling and then I thought oh well if I learned to swim properly um I could do a triathlon um some of the queens were doing a triathlon so I did that and I did it breaststroke but I really loved it the variety was great in in the one race we did swim bike and then I had to jog the run because i was injured so i signed up for a, when lockdown finished i signed up for a course to learn to do front crawl and did that with an amazing online women's group called pretty gritty who do some women's coach sessions in harrogate and bradford so i learned to do front yeah. crawl and i can now swim a, you know a couple of kilometers um without stopping so going to triathlon and that's when the weight fell off is that oh, I was just wow. like building exercise <laughs> into my day um and mixing with people who really valued looking after their body so i joined the triathlon yeah. club bingley harriers for running the two cycling clubs um and now i'm a qualified coach in swim bike run and triathlon um and i am a swimming teacher as well part-time just once a week i do a little session so incredible <laughs> i'm wow. busy incredible yeah, it's like you you completely had a, a a life transformation into something that you really enjoy and and we're like when you're talking they can hear that buzz in your you know in your voice and like your your aura is so wonderful and and just so happy and excited and full of life and joy and you know you must feel just completely different to where where you were before um and I, and in all that time that is when you obviously you know as it says on your thing the founder of now i can't see it very well because of my eyesight <laughs> but so i know it's, it's the crystal so where Carnelius, did the title yeah. come from yeah so i Carnel do know my crystals but not well, all see i i don't so my fantastic um colleague in Carnelia's Liz she lives on the Isle of Wight and she gave we met on Soberistas online during lockdown so she gave yeah. up drinking same day as me 1st of January 2020 and we were put in the same team for the 100 day challenge so everyone right. who gave okay. up drinking on that day was in a team 
uh, supporting each other and we just really gelled in the online um chat rooms and everything and then started message messaging each other separately and on our soberversary um first january 2021 she said right you know we're in our 40s we're ladies of a certain age we need to be doing some weight training um so how about we dial in on whatsapp video and do some weights together a couple of times a week so we did that three times a week um six o'clock in the morning because i left for work so early i was working incredibly long hours <laughs> at, at school i know um <laughs> but we obviously we had a great chat because we didn't get that puffed out we were doing like a few reps of reasonably heavy yeah. weight so we could chat and we were talking about how you know when you've got someone else to do it with you you stick to it you know i was getting up at six i was actually getting up at five going for a run or a cycle or even just a bit of a hike and then coming and doing the weights with liz and i wouldn't skive it because i knew she'd be left wondering where i was i'd be letting her down and we were saying just that power of of people getting together and holding each other to account um, yes, I might wake up and think, oh, I wish I hadn't arranged to do this today. I'm really not feeling it. <laughs> but that's how you build a new habit. You get over that and you start to see the benefits. And, you know, once you start going, oh, 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 I'm pleased yeah, with good. that. Check this. And you've got, you know, you've, <laughs> once you start to see results, then that feeling yeah. of, oh, I can't be bothered, it really eases down. You know, it's yeah. still there sometimes, but you think, no, no, I'm going to do it because I want to maintain these results. I want to build on these results. I want to feel this good going forward, not just today. Um, so we chatted and chatted about this and, and Liz was very comfortable. I mean, Liz had been, her and her husband had a wine merchant business. So okay. when she gave up drinking, that became really inconvenient because she wasn't going to do tastings. Yeah. You know, she didn't want to be around yeah. it all the time. Um, <clears throat> but she was a businesswoman. I was a school teacher. I knew nothing about starting a business, but she convinced me that we should do it uh, at some point in the future if circumstances ever permitted. And I was like, that's never going to happen. I love my job. Absolutely love my job. But last about 15, 16 months ago, I just reached a point of complete burnout in my school leadership role. There were so many okay unfilled vacancies and it was it's an outstanding school and it's an amazing place to work but unfortunately we just there's just a massive shortage of teachers and we could not attract the right recruits so i was covering more and more people's jobs and then a colleague was taken very ill at school and she's much better now but she's still off like 15 16 months later and i was asked to cover aspects of her job and I just couldn't cope anymore. So I decided I wanted to find a, an exit pathway, but because I was the main breadwinner, I couldn't just quit. And I I should have taken some time off with, you know, work-related stress. And I was advised by occupational health to do that. But I had this ridiculous sense that if I go, then somebody else is going to you know that's just another person who's not there and it's not fair on the kids and it's not fair on the families we serve and it's not fair on my colleagues so i just refused to take any time off and just staggered on till the next holiday um did you did you at any time feel that you wanted a drink because of the, the no look, yeah luckily look the thing that kept me sane was the exercise i was getting up at five and yeah. swimming like there's a, um, a, a former reservoir that's now just more like a lake that that people swim in near me i was going up there before school or i was cycling or i was running um i had friends from an amazing friend jill from my tri club who lives quite near me and we would go out together and she's a nurse so she knew what it was like in frontline services she worked with um sort of children as well so she knew how hard it can be so we um <clears throat> we would unload our woes to each other get our stress relief running or cycling or whatever and then go off to work and luckily no it never it never I mean trying to do my job when I was drinking was hard but since then we'd had lockdown and all the problems with mental health that meant for the families we work with um yeah. <clears throat> I couldn't even have imagined you know getting back into that cycle it would have been horrific so yeah, I got completely burnt out. And then we, luckily, we um, were gifted a re really quite large amount of money by a family member. Um, he just decided, you can't take it with you. Um, so he gave us this big chunk of money. So we took a massive 
chunk out of our mortgage and I was able to go part time and not be on the senior leadership team anymore. So then I've got this nice balance, got a bit of money coming in. And so Liz said, well, is now the time <clears throat> when we're going to do this women's support network thing? And I thought, you know yeah. what it is, you know, just the universe telling me it's time Absolutely. to do something different. Yeah, things happen for a reason, don't they? So, and it seems like that, that you know, how you've told your story, where you've got to in your own life, where you were on that burnout and, you know, and then this wonderful person gifted a huge mm -hmm. amount of money where you were able to make that change again. It's yeah. definitely coming from the universe. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I didn't know anything about manifestation or anything like that back then, but I think I was doing it. <laughs> you were doing it whether you knew or not, Lucy. It was yeah. happening. <laughs> yeah, so Carnelius was born. And so Liz, to answer your question about the name of the, the, yes. the organisation, I went down to the Isle of Wight to see Liz. I'd already been down once to visit her as a family to go on holiday. And then um, I went down October last year <clears throat> to um, sort of set everything up do the company's house bit and register us as a business and um we were like what we're we gonna call ourselves <laughs> and we just couldn't think of a name and we did all the thing you know we googled and it's like think of your favorite animal and your favorite color and i was like oh purple panda no what's that, that <laughs> <laughs> i love that that's oh, weird no way. Um, <clears throat> I am in it. My soberistas team is called Pandas People, and we are amazing. There's I nothing, love that. nothing against pandas. I love it. There's but no judgments whatsoever from me. I didn't think it was the best uh, name for a business. It wouldn't, you know, yeah, of course. wouldn't say what we did or anything like that. So in the end, Liz said, "Look, let's go through my books of like pull books off the shelves." And she's really into, mm. you know, um, crystals and heal Reiki and healing and all this kind of stuff. Um, so I was like a bit dubious, but I pulled this crystal book off the shelf and opened it up and there was this beautiful kind of terracotta rust colored stone. And it said, Carnelian gives you the power to create change. And I just went, this is it. This is, this is, this is the crystal for our business. And she was like, look, she read it through and she knew a bit about crystals, but she wasn't, you just hadn't memorized every single one. And uh, Carnelian works with your sacral chakra. Yeah. And it's a very um, energizing stone that gives you the power to create the changes you want in your life. So we were like, well, this is it. So we thought about Carnelias. It sounds like a group of women, you know, like yeah. Latin words that end in A-S, yes. a feminine plural. So we turned oh, Carnelian yes, into Carnelias. <laughs> and that's where it comes from. So it's a bit of a mouthful and I do have to spell it a lot but we think it's the right name for what we're trying to do. I think it's beautiful. And um, when you like hear the, like where it come from as well, do you know what I mean? And all that side of it, it's just, it just feels so like, wow. Um, and it must be so empowering for you to be able to support so many other people now. Um, and just when you think about, years ago where you were to where you are now i mean that's just in absolute incredible you are a real inspiration lucy you really are and i'm just like in awe just listening to what you what you spoke about tonight it, it's just it's just wow it really is a wow moment um so thank you for sharing your story tonight it, as i say it really means a lot so we are kind of coming to the end of um, today's episode, but um, obviously I'm like around the mental health and the creativity, but I feel that that's woven in without actually mm. having to use the word because of everything that you do. You, you've you used so much creativity without, you know, you, you were a teacher, you know, you work with children. So there's all that side of it anyway, but then where you started to, using your creativity to get to where you are now creativity that as in, in you were in you got into sports you're still using it aren't you and it's almost like woven in so i don't feel that i need to almost ask you any questions about that as such because i feel it's just woven in so beautifully mm -hmm. and that kind of says that even though we don't think we are creative as business owners as women as mums, you know, um, or as people, we absolutely are 
because it can, it's just part of your world without even thinking about even thinking about a name i mean purple pandas is absolute awesome um i love the name that you chose you know the connected to the crystal so yeah just absolute wonderful so to finish um before we finish then um have you got three tips for the audience for the people who's listening um maybe around kind of when they are at that struggle around alcohol so first one would be go online and look at amazing groups like the Sober Club, Soberistas, Sober Butterfly Collective. Like Sober Butterfly Collective is completely free. There's no charge to join or anything like that. The only thing you pay for is if you go to a meetup and they're going to the theatre or whatever, you pay for your ticket. Um, and so, yeah, that's the first one. Make connections. You know, the opposite of connection, the opposite of addiction is connection addiction thrives on you being alone and being scared and feeling stigma and not speaking out so make connections with these groups um second one would be um if you decide you want to give up and then you do drink again don't beat yourself up about it nearly everybody does it that i i am really odd in just stopping that's just really unusual very few people that i know have actually done that don't beat yourself up about a slip see it as a learning point on a journey okay so it's like you've taken a wrong turn you're still on the journey you're just going to get back on track you know what you need to do turn around you go back but analyze what happened what was the trigger some people get surprised the trigger is that they're really happy and that's when they drink they're at mm -hmm. a celebration a wedding a birthday a holiday um so just analyze the trigger see it as a learning point and move on. It's, it's, it's good. It's taking you close to your destination. And then the third thing would be educate yourself. So read quick lit, as we call it, Alcohol Explained by William Porter or um, The Sober Revolution by Lucy Rocker or um, The Unexpected Joy of Being Sober by Catherine Gray. There's loads of amazing quick lit books out there. And some are more sort of sciencey, some are personal stories, some are really empowering. Quit Like a Woman by Holly Whitaker is amazing. Um, but yeah, just immerse yourself in the podcasts and the quick lit and the community, and you'll sort of deal with those demons that say you're on your own here, nobody else has this problem. Just put that to one side, you're not alone. Thank you so much. They are amazing tips. Um, so where can people find you, Lucy? Yeah, so um, our website is carnelias.com. And if you go there, you can put your email address in and we will let you know when we do our full launch. So we've got our website up and running. We are gathering the email addresses of interested people. Um, and we're going to be launching in the next couple of months our full membership organisation. It's going to be quite cheap, like about £7 a month. Um and it'll deal with fitness, nutrition. Liz is a, a nutrition advisor. That's her, her background. Um, it'll be fitness, nutrition, parenting, um, sober curious and sober, you know, advice. Um, and we'll be offering one-to-one -one coaching um, for additional cost if people would like it. But the main thing is building a community of people who want to do things like run the first park run or get couch to 5k complete or run the first marathon dressed in a costume yeah. or sort <laughs> out the diet start cooking from scratch or you know there's so many things you might set goals for but that's what we're there for to find people to help you along your journeys to set those goals to hold each other accountable um, and be cheerleaders and um, supporters along the way incredible absolutely incredible wow <laughs> amazing honestly just absolutely loved it well i'm just gonna say thank you thank you for coming on today and being my guest um i've absolutely loved listening to you and just seeing the huge transformation in your life congratulations um you know from the journey that you've been on um because life's not easy is it you know so and um yeah i've really it's been just so beautiful to hear um so we are just about coming to the end of today's episode um i just want to say thank you so much lucy to my guest um for joining us today um i will add all her links um so that if you want to contact her then you can even if you just want 
that you know you're worried about something and it could be to do with weight or anything that she spoke about as such then you know then you can contact her um what an amazing lady she is absolutely and um that is it for tonight and that is it for april so i will be back in may with more episodes and more guests uh, more to come soon so i just want to say good night to everybody and enjoy the rest of your evening see you all for now bye, bye.